Welcome, Gil. Thanks for hanging out with me on the podcast today. Well, thanks for inviting me, Fritz, and it's a, it's a pleasure to be here. Always good to talk to you. Yeah, great to catch up. We'll do that a little today as well, I'm sure. Uh, I've known you for a while now. Uh, gosh, how long have we known each other since? I think the first time I recall meeting you is when you were a PhD graduate student with Tony Wolf at Virginia Tech, and you were also working as a vineyard manager in North Carolina and also teaching at Surrey Community College Viticulture as well. Is that right? That's correct. It's, that's what was going on. I think it was about 08, 09, somewhere in there. It's, over, it's well over 10 years ago. We know. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. I was always impressed with what you're doing. And I also recall that, you know, you weren't the typical right out of undergrad um, graduate student, but you, you decided to go back a little bit later for that degree. And I don't know, I think that could offer some good inspiration for those that are getting into viticulture later in life or maybe transitioning from another uh, major in, in the university or even another career path in life. And so, I don't know, any advice for those who may think they're late to the table for getting involved in, in the vineyard and wine industry? Yeah, I, I don't know if you'd call it advice, um, but uh, that would be a generous description of it. But it's like, I don't, I, I think everybody has their own personal decision to make as to what's late and what's early in grapes. You know, they're intergenerational or generational. So if you're planting a grapevine, you're probably planting it for your children and grandchildren more than for yourself, despite what other, what age at which you start. So I was always encouraged by that, uh, just hanging out with the grapevines and, and those that cared for them all ages. So before we jump into your trials, maybe uh, let's get started with just some, some basic rootstock talk. Uh, can you give us a quick review, Gil, especially for the new grower who's listening, on exactly what we mean when we talk about grapevine rootstocks and, uh, and even how rootstocks originated? Right. So um, rootstocks, first of all, been around for a long time. There, there is a, there's reference to them in uh, Roman times where grafting was pretty well accepted practice amongst uh, the Roman grape growers. Okay. So that was in place, but more recently in the last couple hundred years, the impetus was from the, uh, a root louse, an aphid like, um, insect phylloxera that was imported to Europe in the late, uh, part of the 1800s. And it actually ruined their grape industry, wiped it out. And so they needed something to combat that phylloxera. And so the idea was advanced by, uh, entomologist. Um, and from this country who came up with the idea of grafting to an American rootstock, North American rootstock to a European top. So we're joining a scion with the, with the desired fruit characteristics to a rootstock with the desired capability to resist or tolerate phylloxera. And those rootstocks basically are from the North American continent. And uh, so that's how recently we've come to that point. Most Grape industries around the world are based on uh, grafted grapevines, joining that scion to that rootstock. There are some places where phylloxera hasn't yet infested, and so those places are still using own rooted uh, grapevines. Yeah. But, so, for example, you know uh, Merlot or Chardonnay or Chambers yeah. is a hybrid. These are all the varieties that we you refer to as the scion, which is the top part that gets grafted onto the rootstock, and it's exactly. true to type. It's uh, it's not some hybrid. It's true to type. I think that's why there's a lot of resistance at first in Europe to um to grafting. They weren't sure if it would affect the flavors of the fruit, and in fact, it could, depending on how the rootstock grows. But that's a true to type genetic uh, variety, if you will, or cultivar that's being grafted on there. So just for those out there who aren't familiar with how the grafting works, you take those those cuttings or buds from that, let's say Merlot, and then you graft that that cane or that bud onto the rootstock, which is, which is what Gil it's, uh, it's usually American in some, uh, yeah, some it's American. And there's a whole, there's about, oh, I'd say almost 10 species that are used. Belanda arii, riparia, pestris, um, all these things are different American found in the North American continent that were grafted either as a species or as a cross between those species onto the, the vitus vinifera. Or which you mentioned Merlot, Cabernet, and those, those uh, desired. Some rootstocks grow in their environment in wet soil. Some grow in desert soils where it's dry. Some can grow well in acidic, low pH soils, some in high pH soils. So the, the, the 
great thing about the breeding is they can take one uh, positive aspect or component of one native rootstock, crossbreed it with another rootstock for something else, like maybe easy propagation for one rootstock and adaptation to high pH soils without suffering from um, lime chlorosis. They mix those together and now you have a rootstock you can plant onto a lime, high lime soil with um, maybe good drought resistance and it's easy to propagate by the nursery, for example. Exactly. So, exactly. Uh, so, so, so I think it's cool that um, we've been able to figure this out, but I feel like there's so many combinations and so many new rootstocks that are coming out that have not even been trialed yet. Um, so, you know, let's, let's talk a little bit about that. Let's dive into what you've done to, to trial rootstocks. And, right. and I, I guess I would start by saying um, there's kind of two branches really for expanding our knowledge on rootstock selection. And one is to do things like you'd done in, to do things like you had done in New Mexico, which is to grab a whole bunch of rootstocks that are commercially available that right. really haven't been tested in that specific region and plant them all in a, an experiment where there's a replicated trial where you can statistically compare one to the next. And then there's a whole nother branch where um, there's a breeding program that would bring new rootstocks into the fold um, to, to basically help us resist other new challenges that are coming up in different climates and environments. So why, why do we need to continue to trial and develop rootstocks, Gil? Okay, let me just follow up on what you said, Pritch, because I think it's an excellent um, a characterization of what's going on with rootstocks. We have the whole breeding effort and then we have the trialing effort. And I'm more of an extension person and applied scientist, if you will. And so I'm into the trialing part of it. I'm certainly not a breeder. So we do look at commercially available rootstocks and trial them. Um, having said all that, we were after just some basic grower concerns and that's cold tolerance and, um, and this in trying to preclude phylloxera infestation. So ours is very applied. Why should we continue to do that? Well, if you've heard of this thing called climate change, it might be behoove us to be ahead of that curve. So we did extensive um, characterization of the, of the climate in where we did this trial in New Mexico. So hopefully our results can be extrapolated and applied in other regions. And I wanna do a uh, mention of two other significant or substantial rootstock trials, one in Canada with Jim Wilworth and the other one in Oregon with uh, Patty Skinkis' group up there. Both were long-term studies, both are somewhat ongoing, and those will be very informative as, as growers face different climates and extremes. So these trials are important because they can help people uh, or growers, I should say, regionally, but also there can be, what, what I'm hearing you say is they can be compared from one region to the next and, and there can be some general observations made. Like uh, we know 1103P has been touted for uh, drought tolerance and uh, faster root regeneration after a period of drought. And so that automatically should make anyone who's um, growing grapes in a region that's experiencing more frequent droughts uh, pop their ears up a little bit. And then, you know, yes. maybe researchers in those regions specifically looking for rootstocks that are drought tolerant to trial. And I guess it could be done where, uh, and it is done where sometimes trials focus on only one aspect of the challenge in hand, you know. Right. Um, and we're going to get into that because I'd like to know what all you were looking for. You already mentioned cold. Uh, you mentioned that you needed um, some resistance for phylloxera. And so maybe we can dive into that a little. In New Mexico, where you work uh, on this trial, um, you mentioned grape growers are growing own rooted um, vines. So let's dig into that and maybe talk about what that means, own rooted. Yeah. So there's a tradition in New Mexico of uh, just using own rooted vines, especially when you get north in that state of Albuquerque. And because about every 10 years, there's a, there's a really cold snap that'll come through something that is well below zero, kill these vines to the ground. So the grower's concern was, well, you know, I can bring an ungrafted vine back up from its own roots, whereas I can't do that with a grafted vine. And don't even begin the conversation with about mounding up as a protective uh, measure. Uh, but so mounding up being placing soil around the graft union before the right. winter temperatures and insulates the graft. And then you've got to go back in the spring 
and remove the soil because if you don't, the roots might start growing from the scion variety, which could be your Merlot, for example, or like we used the example before. It's a lot of work. It's hard to mechanize. We get it. Okay. Yeah. So uh, we just wanted to put in this trial There's with these commercially available rootstocks to see which one would, uh, first of all, survive the cold. So we, we, we looked at their mortality over a period of about 10 years. Uh, this trial was actually planted in 2008 or nine, and we started taking extensive uh, data uh, beginning in 2017. Yeah. And following through the 2022 season. So, and you know, actually, Fritz, I can share some of those data slides with you if, you're, if your audience is interested uh, that shows this, you know, in, in tabular form. But yeah, we, we, got, we got good data on that. Um, and so that's basically was the main impetus of, of the trial.